Well, listen, we're starting a new series today. I'm excited about this new series. I'm excited because I feel like God is going to really show us a few things that we need to know. How many of you, how many of you have ever had an enemy in your life? If two people raise their hand, you guys are, oh, there you go. Enemies come and go, right? Enemies are part of life. We all have them. One of the biggest things that we can say as a Christian is face your enemy just like David did. David slayed his, his giant, his Goliath, and that's what we're called to do. But let me, let, me, let me give you another thought. What if we needed our enemies? What if we needed our enemies? You think about it, the enemies have a purpose. They have a purpose, and that is to throw you off of your purpose. That's the whole reason for enemies. No matter what it is, no matter what you're doing in life, the whole point in anybody coming against you in opposition is to take you off the path that which you were going. That's the whole reason for it. So if you look at it, an enemy is just somebody or or something or a circumstance that takes you off the path that God has before you for your purpose. That's why we have enemies. That's why enemies come. If not, there would be no reason for an enemy. An enemy is not going to do something good for you. So an enemy has a purpose, and that is to throw you off the purpose that God has laid before you. So today, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the reason that we have enemies and what an enemy can actually do for us. Now, I want to start out by saying this. Every person here, God has an intent for your life. He has, as the Bible says, numbered your steps. He knows exactly He knows exactly what your purpose is on an individual basis. He knows these things. He set them before you. It's our job to walk in them. No matter what your circumstance is, no matter what you've gone through in life, no matter what your past looks like, all this kind of thing, you have a reason for being here. Everybody, amen? You have a reason. Now, I want to say this because people need to hear this part right here. So listen carefully. You may be the product of, of a mistake, but you're not the mistake. Do you hear me? You may be the product of a mistake, but you're not the mistake. God did, does not create mistakes. He does not make mistakes. So therefore, you are not a mistake no matter how you got into this world. I felt like first service, somebody needed to hear that, and I feel like second service, somebody needs to hear that too, because a lot of times we struggle with that. What is my real, what is my real identity? Who, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to be doing on this planet? What am I here for? You're here for something because God puts you here, and he doesn't make problems. He doesn't make mistakes, so keep that in mind today. When I was younger, I made a lot of bad choices. Anybody ever done that? Lots of bad choices. Matter of fact, it was bad choices that got me saved. As crazy as that sounds, uh, it was a, the bad choices I made that had brought me to that place of needing a savior in my life. I had to make a choice. I was at a crossroads. I was either going to continue the lifestyle I had or I was going to change my life. Praise God for grace. I changed my life. God came in and, and did some amazing things. But I will tell you this, that enemy in my life, which was my lifestyle at the time, My enemy became something I needed to bring me to the place where I saw the need I had in Jesus. Does that make sense? So that enemy of my life that I battled all the time, I'm doing these things. I know I shouldn't be doing them, but I continue to do them. Why am I doing this? I was beating myself up. I was mad at myself, but I will continue continue to do it, continue to live in that lifestyle of sin that I was in. And then I came to know Jesus, but then I realized that lifestyle was my enemy because it was keeping me from the purpose that God had for me. So I needed that to get to this place of change that happened not long after that. I lost friends. I had to move, found myself at the end of my rope, but I'm thankful today for grace. How many can say you're thankful for grace today? Amen. So one of the biggest enemies that we have as Christians, as believers, is called a comfort zone. That is one of the biggest enemies the church can have, is a comfort zone. We get caught in our comfort zone, therefore we refuse to change, we refuse to go forward in whatever it is God has for us. So we have to be careful with that when we're looking at our purpose, because our purpose, God did not create us to stay in one place. He did not create us to stay in a comfort zone, he created us to move forward. And if we fail to move forward, then we fail to understand 
what it means to walk in the purpose that God has for us. Now, when we're looking at the enemy, the idea of an enemy, I want to talk about purpose today. Next week, I'm going to give you a heads up. Next week, we're going to talk about identity. And I want to show you how it was, it was the identity that was labeled on Christ that caused the enemy to come. I'm going to show you that next week, so be sure you, you tune in there. But today, we're going to talk about purpose because we have to understand purpose before we can go any further in this series. If we don't understand purpose, then we're not going to be able to get anything out of the weeks to come. If you don't know your purpose, you will find it difficult to determine what and who are the true enemies coming against you. It's easy to label someone an enemy and come to find out they were never really the enemy at all. Your enemy will always, always come after your purpose because if it can destroy your purpose, it can destroy you. That's the point, right? I mean, you look at right now, I'm going to throw this out there as an example, and it's, it's a sobering example. Right now, the suicide rate for America is up. Why is that? Because people's purpose has been taken away from them, right? People losing their jobs, people losing family members, whatever it may be, their purpose has been pulled out from under them like a rug, just pulling a rug out from under them in life, and now they've lost their sense of who they are. So now you see what they're doing and how they're reacting to it. If you lose your purpose, you lose what God wants to do for you or what God wants to do in your life. You and I have a common enemy, and that's Satan. We all know this, right? He wants to ensure that God's purposes are not accomplished. He will do whatever, and he will use whoever is available. So whenever I see something or someone that stands in the way of the mandates of God's purposes on my life, I identify them as enemies that I must engage. Now I think about a lot of times we don't even see enemies right in front of us or we mislabel people. Don't label someone an enemy who's trying to help you grow. That's not your enemy. The enemy is someone who's trying to keep you from what God wants you to do in life. That becomes an enemy. I think about God who called this big assembly of, of angels together in heaven. Because, see, the Bible says that the devil comes as an angel of light sometimes, right? Everybody knows that scripture, or most people have heard it before. Comes as an angel of light. So God calls together an assembly of angels that come before him, and then when they all pull up, God says this, why are you here? He was talking to Satan who was in the middle of his angels. It wasn't the angels who recognized him. It was God who recognized him. He had somehow slipped inside the whole assembly of angels. And the angels said nothing. It was God who called him out. A lot of times the devil will do that in us. They'll, he'll slip into our lifestyle. He'll slip into our life. He'll become something in front of us that's keeping us from the purpose. But the fact of the matter is he's coming as an angel of light, something we think is good when in fact it, he's actually an enemy. Jesus had this problem. Jesus was meeting with all his disciples and he was talking to them and he said, okay, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to Jerusalem and I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. Anybody remember what happened? About that time, Peter steps up and he says this. No way. That's not going to happen. There's no way that's going to happen. Then look what Jesus said. Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God. Now remember, Jesus had just called Peter the rock in which he was going to build his church. And now he's looking at Peter going, Get behind me, Satan. I mean, he's calling him a name right there in front of everybody. Jesus identified the enemy, and he engaged. Now, understand this. Peter was not the enemy, but Peter was being utilized by the enemy to defeat the purpose that Jesus had. He was standing in the way of the purpose of Christ. The purpose was to go, to suffer, to die on the cross for all humanity. And, Je and Peter, because, because he loved Jesus so much, he tried to stand in the way of the purpose that God had created Jesus for. Anybody confused yet? Do you understand what I'm saying? When I was 19 years old, I was called into ministry. I, felt, I knew God spoke. I mean, I was driving in my car. I was listening to worship music. You know, all the right things to do to hear from God, right? That was a joke. And so 
I hear God say, you're, you're going to be a ministry. You're going to be a full-time ministry. Because I had, I had plans to go to college. I had all this, this other like secular college, university, and do all this stuff. And I was going to be the best you know, NFL football player anybody had ever seen with my height and stature. <laughs> had all these dreams and aspirations. And by that time, God speaks to me and says, I'm taking you down a new path. So I was all excited. I'm 19 years old. I don't know much, right? I'm dumb as they come right there, you know? And so I come in there, and I go in my family, and I say, God called me to ministry. I'm going to be a pastor. First thing I got was, you need to rethink that. Why don't you do this? Why don't you, like, go to school for both and have something to fall back on? Why don't you rethink that because there's not a lot of money in that? Why don't you not do that because, uh, you know, the church people don't treat pastors right. I mean, I'm hearing, like, I'm hearing all this, right? Why don't you not do that because we don't know how long the church will be around? Listen, I'm getting all this, and this is from people I love. Family, friends, all these are people I love. Now, here's the idea. They became, at that moment, they became my enemy. Not in the sense that we look at enemies. Not like they were trying to hurt me because they loved me. I loved them, they loved me. Peter loved Jesus. Peter loved Jesus. Jesus loved Peter. But at that moment, Jesus had to engage the enemy that was trying to stop his purpose from taking place. I had to engage the enemy to try to, who was trying to stand in the way of the purpose God had for me. God called me to be a pastor. He called me to step into full-time ministry. No matter what it comes with, no matter how hard it may be, that's what my purpose was. And these people whom I loved were standing in the way of the purpose God had laid before me. But so many times we allow that to happen and we look at these people and go, well, you know what? Maybe they're right. Maybe they're right. No, they're not right. God's right. If God speaks to you, you follow that path of purpose that he has for you. Don't let people get in front of it. That's when enemies become enemies. That's how they become enemies, when we allow them to stand in front of our purpose. Peter was actually saying, I will stand in the way of your purpose being fulfilled. He became an enemy that day. It is possible for a true disciple of Christ today, by his own carelessness and immaturity, to become the instrument of Satan and to oppose the message of the cross. Listen, Satan is not as powerful as God, but Satan is powerful. You better keep that in mind. A lot of times we think, well, you know, Satan's a weenie. No, Satan's not a wimp. He will come after you, and if you let your guard down, he will win. He will. He, he beat Peter. He used Peter as an instrument of destruction, an instrument to derail the purpose that Jesus had. He tempted Eve, brought her crashing down with her husband. Satan, unafraid to tempt Jesus himself in the wilderness. So why wouldn't he be able to tempt us and actually come out on top? Are there not professing Christians whose words and actions have led to the destruction of other believers? Some of the harshest people in the world are Christians. Some of the most brutal people in the world are Christians. Some of the most unforgiving people in the world are people who are professing that they've been forgiven. That doesn't even sound right. That sentence doesn't even sound right. People who have been forgiven much... turn around and throw stones at others. But we do that, right? We're going to get honest today? Is it okay if we talk a little bit? Were it not better for a millstone to be tied around our necks and we thrown, be thrown into the depths of the sea than for Satan to use us to destroy other believers? Absolutely. Now here's another reason that Jesus used that strong language with Peter. The word showed that Peter did not have In his mind, the things of God, but the things of men. His mind was full of human attitudes and opinions and values. His words were a barometer of the state of Peter's mind. Peter was an immature believer. Keep in mind, this is before Pentecost. This is before the mind of Peter was renewed and changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was focused on the purpose 
which was bringing salvation to humanity through his death. And Peter stood in the way of the purpose. Now we all, every one of us, arrive at our purpose through a number of things, such as reading the word, such as prayer, that kind of thing. People in our lives that will speak life into us, people in our lives that will help us on that journey, we all get there in some way. Your gifts and talents are clues and indicators as to how and what you've been put on earth to do. Look at yourself. What are you called to do? What is your purpose? God doesn't get involved. God doesn't get involved in every little thing in our life. I want to say that because I think there's a point here that you need to hear. A lot of times we feel like every small little thing God gets involved with. Now, I didn't say God didn't care. I said he doesn't get involved. If my car battery dies, God doesn't get involved with that. That is something that we just deal with, right? Just, just heard on the way here, my daughter is driving her little car, and the sunroof just flew off of it. <laughs> it's gone. Is that normal? The sunroof just flew off of it. The other night, she was, sorry, I got to tell you this. The other night, she was there. She's not here right now, so I can talk about her. Um, the other night, she comes to me, and she says, Dad, she goes, my, my sunroof lifts up a little bit. It's got a little crack in it. I said, what are you talking about? So I go out there to her car, get in her car, look up. She goes, watch, the sunroof moves when I do this. Well, don't do that. You know, I mean, she's pushing it up, right? I think I know why her sunroof flew off. Um, more than likely, it was because she pushed it out, you know, and it just, just, just flew off. Anyway, thought that was funny. Where was I going with this? Oh, yeah. Those little things like that, I'm wondering if God's chuckling. You know, like, why'd you do that? Why'd you push your sunroof out of your car, you know? Doesn't get involved necessarily. Didn't say he don't care. I'm saying he doesn't get involved. What God does get involved with is the things that destroy our purpose. See, what happens is we want God to get all tore up about whatever tears us up. I'm so mad at this. I'm so mad at this. God, you should be mad at it too. And God's going, no, I'm not mad at it. That's part of life. But when that person steps in the way of the purpose I have for you, then you'll see me come in. You see, God does have a time where he steps in. Solomon wrote in Ecclesiastes 3 that life will take you through seasons, a time to live and a time to die, a time to mourn, a time to rejoice. You've probably heard that. If, you, if you're old enough, you've probably heard it was about the birds who sung that song. You know, some people know what I'm saying. Enemies will come along to show you seasonal changes. It's those things in life that you have to con conquer when they pop up. They are signifying to you that one thing is finished and another thing is beginning. That you are headed towards full completion of the purpose that God has assigned to you. Listen, we all go through seasons in life. But in every season, you can expect the enemy to come after you, especially if it's fulfilling the purpose that God has laid before you. You can expect it. It's going to happen. I think about... This pandemic that is shaking our world. I'm here tired of just hearing about the pandemic. Well, I'm going to bring it up again. <laughs> this pandemic is shaking our world. It's been called the invisible enemy. It's the enemy. No doubt, it's an enemy. It has come against the church probably more than anything. The pandemic is threatening our purpose. How, is, how can we put to this, this to, a, to a cool little um, illustration here? Let me, let me explain. I'm not going to get political right now, but I'm going to say something that's going to sound political. Churches across America are being forced to close, like state mandate close. Pastors going to jail for opening their church. Abortion clinics have, have not received that word. Neither have bars and clubs and anything like that. 
That's where it's going to sound political, but I'm not getting political. I'm making a point. The church has a purpose. The purpose is to bring humanity to a relationship with Jesus. Why would the enemy defeat the purpose of an abortion clinic when he owns it? He's going to try to defeat the purpose of the church. Here's the great thing. We're seeing failure here. During the pandemic, more people have been reached with the gospel than ever before in the history of the world. Let me tell you why. Because social media, live streaming, the ability for the church to uh, navigate through this and to actually reach more people through these means than ever before. I've heard stories. I don't know how many stories I've heard. People have gotten saved because they watched online. They wouldn't step foot in the door, but they got saved because they watched online. Now, here's the great thing about that. The church has learned to adapt, but here's the bad thing about it. There are still Christians out there that are hiding underneath a rock right now and gripped in fear. I'm not saying anything's wrong with being cautious about this thing. It's real. I get it. But there's something about allowing fear to grip you to the point of I will not leave my house. You understand? I believe that, I believe our church, I believe many churches across the country and across the world have engaged the enemy. You want to fight? Let's fight. I'm going to engage the enemy in this. I believe it's the church's duty to say, get behind me, Satan, you're a stumbling block to the purpose that God has for me. This is a little snapshot of what we're going to talk about next week, but I want to say this. Do you think it's possible? Do you think it's possible that the church needed this enemy? Think about it. Did we get too comfortable in what we were doing that we needed? We needed an enemy. We needed an enemy to come against us. The church is very comfortable. Have our service on Sunday. People come, we sing a few songs, we hear a message and we go home or we try to get out as soon as we can to get to the restaurants. We get comfortable with this stuff. But then all of a sudden, this life-altering pandemic comes into play. And it forces the church to think differently. There are churches now that have never had online services that are now having them because they were forced to. This enemy forced us to reevaluate our purpose and to either engage or to cower back. And I believe the church is engaged and now has reached more people millions more people for Jesus than ever before. Giants come in stages of life. Every conflict, if embraced properly, will reveal itself to you as a necessary step towards purpose and destiny. I'm going to leave you with this thought. David wasn't given Goliath until he fought the lion and the bear on the back of the hillside while he was tending sheep. Every battle we face, every enemy that comes against us is not a Goliath. But we're still to be faithful with keeping the, the, the line of purpose that God has given us. The little things are still enemies that we have to engage. The problem is sometimes we see those little things as major things and we never get ready. We never get prepared for the big things that are coming. I'm going to show you next week how David needed not only Goliath, but he needed Saul. And those two catapulted him into kingship. But he needed them for those moments in his life. Our Goliaths will come, our lions will come, our bears will come. But understand this, those will be enemies that we will need to build our character, our faith, our integrity, our, and challenge the way we think. We will need them for that. Those that came against me in my calling, the beginning of my career 20-something years ago, I had a choice. I could listen or I could engage. I could 
I could back down or I could engage. What was my choice going to be? What we have to do is we have to allow, we have to allow it to challenge us to the point of keeping our focus. It's easy to get swayed one way or another. Easy to get swayed. Now, why did Jesus, as I'm closing here, why did Jesus need Peter at that moment? Because all he did was look at him and rebuke him. It wasn't like something happened to, to change Jesus' life. I think about a lot of times in my life specifically because I, I, I know me better than I know you. There's been times where I reacted a certain way that didn't, wasn't favorable to me. Anybody ever been there before? Either you shoot your mouth off or you, you know, a knee gut reaction gets you in trouble. Been there many times. Many times. I think about Jesus and his rebuke of Peter had a purpose to it. It wasn't just to make Peter shut up. It wasn't the reason. But if you look at it, he had just, he was with his disciples and he just told all his disciples, hey, I'm going to Jerusalem, I'm going to suffer and I'm going to die. Then Peter steps up and says, no, you're not. No way, that's not going to happen. Look at it, I think it's verse 22 in Matthew 16. And then Jesus engaged the enemy. His disciples were still there when he engaged the enemy. Jesus being the Messiah, he was the Savior. They all looked at him and how he would react to this. He could have said, it's okay, Peter. It's going to be okay. He could have done it that way, and they probably wouldn't have thought anything of it. But instead, he chose to engage what was now an enemy between him and his purpose being fulfilled. He was actually trying to stop Peter, trying to stop the purpose that Jesus had. So Jesus was forced to engage. But in that engagement of the enemy before him, his disciples saw what it looked like to take authority over that what was in, their, in the path between them and what God had called them to do. They saw the authority that they have through Christ and that they were about to be given through his death and resurrection. They saw it. And you look at the New Testament, you look at after Jesus dies, you see the disciples, the ones who are uh, the account of those disciples, you see them using that power in their ministry to step up, to cast out demons, to heal the sick, all because of the power and authority they had through Christ. But Jesus had to show them that day how to use it. A lot of times, Christians, we don't know how to use it. We have to understand anything that stands in the way between you and the purpose God has laid before you becomes an enemy at that moment that we have to engage. Does that make sense? Stay with me through this series. I'm asking you, stay with me through this series because I'm telling you, I'm excited about it. I'm excited about what God's going to do because there's so much more we can learn. But the first thing we have to learn is what it means to have a purpose, what it means to walk in that purpose. Then we can start looking at other things as we go. Care if I pray for you today, is that okay? Jesus, I ask you this morning, Lord, I ask you to help us all to keep our focus on you to keep our focus on what it is you have before us. Lord, the waves come in life. Lord, the different, the different giants that we're looking at facing in life, they come and go. But Lord, you are, you are constant. You are always there. Help us to always keep our focus on you. And Jesus, when those moments come, when it's time to engage the enemies to stand between us and what it is you want us to do, I pray, God, that you'll give us the courage and the strength to engage, to fight, to stand up for what it is that's inside of us. Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the lessons we learned from your word. And I pray today that you
that you will show favor and blessing to every person here, God, that you'll go before them, go behind them, surround them with your presence, fill their home with your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can you give the Lord a hand clap? Listen, I do that because he's worthy of it, right? He is worthy of it.